This morning I'd like for us to do just what the choir has sung, and that is focus our hearts on remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to do that by starting in Genesis 1-1. As we have these words of institution by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels of the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we remember the immediate setting and context of those words prior to his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. But I'd like for us to go back to Genesis 1-1 and just do an overview of God and who he is and then come up to the present context of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to reflect on God and his faithfulness to his word and his promises he's given to us. So this morning we'll begin in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, how we praise your holy and majestic name. For you are indeed the true and living God. And beside you, there are no other gods. And as we worship you today, particularly in observing the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, how we want to remember not only what you've accomplished for us and how you've blessed us, but remember who you are. To be mindful of your love and your grace and your mercy the truth of your word and your holiness. So, Father, I would ask that you keep the evil one from us, that you enable us by your spirit to focus on you and your word, that you cause us to remember exactly who you are today. And we will rejoice in the salvation that you've given us in Christ. And for those here today who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. May you speak to their hearts by your spirit from your word. May you show them Christ in your forgiveness and your mercy, that they too may come to know Christ and be freed from the bondage of sin and death. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You may be seated. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. That's the plural of the name God. Singular is El. Singular, it means Lord, Master, Ruler, Power. In the plural, the emphasis is on the omnipotence of God. The all-powerful God who is sovereign in everything in life, including the election of 2016. Don't forget that, my dear brothers and sisters. He is sovereign in everything. He is more powerful than anything because he's created all things. That's the same God that loves us. That's the God who sent his only begotten son into the world to die for your sin and for mine. That's the God that lives in you and me by his Holy Spirit. This is what we need to remember. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. In this account of creation in verse 7, we read these words. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now we have an additional name added here. Yahweh. Yahweh. The eternal God, the immutable God, who never changes in his being or in his relationship with his people. He's also known as the covenant God of grace. 
and then maintained is Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. By the fact that God revealed himself as Yahweh in this chapter, tells us about the covenant that he established with mankind. Adam, Adam, whose name is mankind, God established a covenant with him. And a covenant is defined as the bond in blood, sovereignly administered by God. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings a curse. And this is what we find here in chapter 2. The emphasis on the relationship that God had established. And we see in verse 7 that when Yahweh Elohim formed God, he formed man, he formed him out of the dust of the ground. But man did not become living until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living creature. The Hebrew word there is not creature. The Hebrew word is nefesh. Man became a living soul. The spiritual life is the life of man. And it's, we're told in Genesis 1 and verse 27 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You and I, and all of mankind are created in the very image of the true and living God. It's a spiritual image. And he created us in his image that he might fellowship with us and commune with us. That he would love us and we would love him in return. We don't need to forget that. That loving, caring relationship that we have with Yahweh Elohim. Then also in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 15, in verse 15 through 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now let's look at this covenant. It's a bond in blood. God takes his relationship with us very seriously. So seriously that he shed the blood of his only begotten son that you and I might have life. There's a commitment on behalf of God to his children, to each one of us today. God has committed himself to us. That covenant is sovereignly administered by God. God set the stipulations of this covenant, not Adam. Christ came and established a new covenant with us and he established that covenant in his own blood. We didn't come up with that. The priest didn't come up with that. It is sovereignly administered by God. And we see here in chapter 2 that God gave the conditions of the covenant. You may eat of every tree, but you will not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. That's a powerful statement. And so now we see that God has sovereignly administered this covenant. He's entered into a very personal commitment and relationship with his people. And then he gives conditions. Obedience brings blessing. The implication here is if I don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I live. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings a curse. You eat from the tree, you die. That's truth. That is truth. And this is what God established for the relationship between himself and his people. Now, let's go to chapter 3 of Genesis and verses 6 and 7. So we want to remember that God has bound himself to us in a covenant. 
And he's made a commitment to us. Chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. You're familiar with these verses of the fall of mankind. Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They broke the covenant. They went right against the teaching of God that he had made so clear to them not to do. And as a result of that disobedience, look what God did. Spiritual death came upon them immediately. You eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And they died spiritually. You see, God is a God of his word. He means business. And you and I need to know that. We need to remember that about God. Yes, he's personally committed to us. And we're going to see his grace and mercy from this point on. But when he says not to do something, he means it. And when he says to do something, he means it. And this is the God we need to remember. Now, let's look at chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. God curses all of mankind and creation. But look at verse 15. He says, he's talking to the woman. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and, the off and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first promise of the Messiah. And we see God's grace here. God could have ended it all right there. You blew it. I told you not to do this. You did it. You're out. But no. God stepped up and intervened for his people. And the day will come when the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. It points to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. You see, God is a God who is faithful to his people even when they disobey. And he points that out and he expects us to confess our sin and repent and ask for forgiveness. And when we do that, he forgives. And so God is a God who is faithful to us, who steps up on our behalf whenever we need him. And we need him all the time. And he does that. Look at verse 21. They had the fig leaves. And look what God does in verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Man's own attempt to cover his sin, his nakedness, doesn't work. It never does. We don't have the ability to cover our sin. God just sees right through it. It's not any good. But God slaughtered an animal. That animal's blood had to be shed. That animal died and his skins covered us. This shows the sacrifices that were to come in the law of God and ultimately the sacrifice of Christ who washes our sin away. Once again, God provides for his people to remain in his presence. Then we go all the way to Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, God has called Abram. He's made him a promise to give him a land. Many nations will come out of him. God will be his God. And when they obey the covenant, God will be a God not only to Abram, but to his people, to the seed descendants of Abraham. Look at 17.1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. 
Now we have a new name, God Almighty, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. The God of all comfort, the God of all blessings. The God that uses all of his powers to do good for his own people. Now, you know, Abram and Sarah, Sarai, they're not young kids at this point. They're kind of up there in age. The childbearing years are gone. And yet they haven't had that child that God promised to them. And when God said to, him, to Abram, I am El Shaddai, he said, Abraham, Abram, I can do this and I will do this. I have the ability. And we all know Sarai, his name was changed to Sarah because she would be the, the mother of the living descendants. And Abram was changed to Abraham from singular to plural, the descendants that God promised to him. We know in Galatians those were spiritual descendants. God fulfilled his promise. God is a God who fulfills promises. Whatever he's promised you and me in his word, he will fulfill it. He's not a deceiver. He's not a liar. He's a God of truth and truth only. And so whatever he's promised you and me, it will come to pass. He's a faithful God, a loving and caring God. He is Yahweh Elohim. El Shaddai. You can depend on him in any circumstance in life. And he will be there for you. He proved it to Abraham. God told Abram that his people would be in bondage for 400 years. And you know, when you get to the end of Genesis, they were, they were in Egypt and they spent years and they became slaves of the Pharaoh and they cried out to God for deliverance. Look at Exodus chapter two, look at Exodus chapter two, verses 23 and 24. Exodus 2, 23 and 24. This is where the Hebrews were just calling out to God to be delivered from this crushing dictator. Exodus 2, 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out help. For their cry, the cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob and God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God responded because of the covenant he had made with Abraham. God is a God who is faithful. He's made promises to us. And he will fulfill those promises, every one of them. And so he remembered that covenant that he had made with the patriarchs. Then we go to Exodus chapter 12, where the Passover is instituted. Exodus chapter 12. And God is getting ready to deliver the people out of Egypt, his people out of Egypt. And look how he does this. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, let's begin with this verse. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. This is the Passover lamb. And after they slaughtered that Passover lamb and properly prepared it, they were to take the blood and they were to put it on the two doorposts and the lentil. Now let's go down to verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, 
I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And we know what happened. The children of Israel did exactly what God said. They prepared that lamb. They put the blood on the lentil and the doorpost. And God passed through that land. And every time he saw the blood on that lentil and doorpost, he passed over that. The houses that did not have it, the firstborn of every family, including Pharaoh, died that night. We're told that life is in the blood. That lamb died in order to free the nation of Israel. That's very significant to the Israelites. It's very significant for us when we think about Jesus Christ shedding his blood on the cross, pouring his life out that you and I may live and not die. The Israelites down through their history were taught this feast and they observed it every year to this day. And they know the significance of the Lamb. Now let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. This is the testimony of John the Baptist as he was preaching and as he see Jesus coming, he had these words in verse 23. In John verse chapter one, in verse 29, the next day he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's talking to a Jewish audience who knew the significance of the Lamb of God. Only this time, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And look at the word sin. It's singular, not plural. A lot of times when Christians quote this passage, they quote it wrongly. Who takes away the sins of the world. It's the sin. What's the significance of that singular word sin? It's two. Original sin. We're all sinners. Every human being since the fall that's been born is a sinner. I mean, we have some cute little babies in our congregation now. Aren't they precious? They're sinners. No, they're not. Oh, yeah? Don't feed them and see what happens. They don't cry. Give me something to eat now. They have a little bit of a temper tantrum, right? Yeah, anybody that's raised a child, anybody that's been around a child at any stage, you don't have to teach a child how to be mean. It comes with the package. Right? We all come with that package of sin. It's original sin. And Christ removed the original sin that brought death to mankind. And Jesus brings life. The other meaning of that word sin being singular is comprehensive. Not only did Jesus die for the original sin, but every sin that you and I will ever commit in our lifetime is forgiven as we confess and repent and ask for forgiveness. It sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? It is. But we have to be sincere. We have to be genuine in our confession, in our repentance, and our asking for forgiveness. We've got to be real. We have to be broken. We have to mean business. But we are forgiven. And when John the Baptist said, Here comes the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, that spoke to the hearts of those Jewish people. And they understood what that meant. God is a God who fulfills His promises. And then we have the life of Jesus and how all the religious leaders got after Him and very, very few actually believed in Jesus. And then we come to the night 
of the Passover feast where Jesus was observing the Passover and he instituted the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And in Luke twenty-two nineteen, in Luke's record of the uh, Passover and the institution of the sacrament, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. That preposition in has a connotation of purpose. I'm doing this so you will always remember me. Remember who I am. Remember my faithfulness to you, my commitment to you. Remember I'm giving my life for you. And you do this, you observe this sacrament and remember the sacrifice that I made for you. And when we come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in just a little bit, that's what we need to remember. The covenant faithfulness of God to his people, to you and to me personally, to this very day and to the end of the age. That relationship that he's established, we need to remember it. In Matthew 26, 28, Matthew's account of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, you'll see these words, for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' substitutionary atonement on the cross was to not cover our sins, but to remove them from us. You see, the animal sacrifices all pointed to, to the crucifixion of Christ. And the author of the Hebrews tells us if the blood of the, of the bulls and the goats were sufficient, Christ would not have had to die. But that, that was all those sins, the, the animals, the blood of the animals just covered them. But the blood of Christ, the pouring out of Jesus Christ's life, washed them away and didn't cover them, but washed them away. You and I are cleansed in the blood of Christ and his life. They're gone. And we're forgiven. We are forgiven both of the, of the sin itself and the guilt that goes along with it. Sometimes Christians think, the Lord will never forgive me of this sin. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. If there's true confession, true repentance, and genuinely asking for forgiveness, you are forgiven in Christ. And that's what you and I need to remember. We are forgiven. Luke 22, 19. Luke, in, in recording his institution words by Christ, this bread is my body which is given for you. This bread is my body which is given for you. What significance is that? It's pretty powerful when you take the words of Christ in Matthew 27, 46, as Jesus was on the cross being crucified and suffering for our sin. You recall he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment the sky was completely black. And we sometimes say that the God, seeing the sin of his people on his son, turned his back on Christ. Maybe he did. I don't know. But there's something deeper here. Because Jesus at that moment suffered the holy and righteous wrath of God on himself for our sin. <coughs> So you and I will never face that. Those of us in Christ will never, never face the wrath of God because of our sin. We will never be condemned. Paul tells us in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need to remember this. We're truly free. There is no wrath. There is no condemnation. And then again in Luke 22, Luke says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. 
Not the blood of animals. In the blood of Christ. It's my blood I'm pouring out. It's my life I'm giving. So you may be cleansed. You may be made pure and holy. You may be acceptable to the Father. I'm making it you acceptable to come into the presence of the Heavenly Father who is holy, holy, holy. That's what we need to remember. Because of the death of Christ and the shedding of His blood and our trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for our salvation, you and I are able to come into the presence of the true and living God even right now as we worship. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19 and verse 30, the last words of Jesus, Telestai, Telestai, translated, it is finished. Literal meaning, paid in full. The judgment of the holy and righteous God who is full of loving kindness and tender mercies accepted the atonement of Christ on our behalf and we receive it by faith as a gift from God because that's what it is and you and I are forgiven do this do this in remembrance of me. So as we come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, these truths I've shared with you from the Word of God, meditate on them as we hold the bread, symbolizing the body of Christ, as we hold the cup of juice, symbolizing the blood of Christ. Remember these truths. Remember these promises. Remember that salvation that you and I have experienced as we have trusted in Christ alone for salvation. Remember this, brothers and sisters. And may the joy of our salvation be full. The Holy Spirit, in giving the Apostle Paul the instructions on observing the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11 said, Let a man examine himself before he comes to the table, lest he eat and drink condemnation on his soul. For that is why many of you are sick and have died. This is a serious time of worship. Not to be taken lightly, not that we do, but just to be remembered that as you and I come to the table, I trust that each one of us have examined thoroughly our hearts before the Lord. And whatever sin the Lord has shown you personally, you confess to the Lord. You repent and you ask for forgiveness and you will be forgiven. Whatever sin we might be holding on to, if you're a believer, don't, don't take to this table. Don't. The purpose of this table is to receive grace by faith. It's not to keep us away, but to draw us to a holy Father who loves us and who convicts of sin and causes us to come to repentance and a closer and deeper walk with Him. Please don't stay away from this table, but please confess your sin and repent and ask for forgiveness and you will be forgiven and worship together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need His grace every day. We need it. We want it. But God said, this is how you get it. You examine your heart, you confess, you repent, you ask for forgiveness, and I will forgive you. And then you come and you eat and you remember the body and you remember the blood and by the faith I will give you grace before we come to the table let's have a time of silent prayer where we examine our hearts 
We come in the righteousness of Christ and not our own. So brothers who are serving today, would you come forward and let's bow our heads and pray in preparation for the sacrament. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you, and yet we come to your throne to worship you today with confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a sinful people, Lord. You know our hearts. You've searched our hearts. And I pray that your children have acknowledged their sin to you, have repented, and have asked for your forgiveness. So we come to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in our own righteousness, for we do not have any, but only in the righteousness of Christ, being cleansed in the blood and freed from the bondage of sin and death, to receive grace through the faith you've given us for our spiritual nourishment and for your glory. Thank you for your presence here. And Father, as we worship you through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I pray that brothers and sisters in Christ, each one of us will remember what you've taught us today. Meditate on that truth. And our fellowship with you in this worship would be even deeper and closer. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.